Cool. All right. Welcome back to the Dharma Doors. Uh, I'm M MC Owens, as usual. Uh, and tonight, um, well, it's a new night. It's a new Sunday night. Um, and the theme tonight is an interesting one. The, the theme tonight is the Saha world. And you may not know this term. Uh, if you do, you're in luck because that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. So this is a term that you really only find in Mahayana Buddhism. It's not really something that you find in the earlier schools. And if you were to go, even like look on Wikipedia, if you were to go look around, you would probably find that the Saha or Saha, Saha world is a, another name for this world, for our world. That's basically what you would find, that it's the Buddhist word, like we use the word earth. They don't use the word earth. <laughs> But that's not actually quite right. It's not just another word for the earth or even, you know, it gets tricky. So this sutra, the sutra that we've been working on, that's sort of been the, the impetus for these Sunday nights as of late, the sutra is called this Manju Shri Buddha Kshetra Guna Vyuha, right? This array, an, an arrangement or an array of virtues of Manju Shri's Buddha land. <laughs> That's the sutra that we're reading. And I've been sort of very slowly working us through the sutra. There's an introductory miracle. Then there's a bodhisattva who has a question. And the question is, how do bodhisattvas adorn or purify their Buddha lands? Specifically, what the first bodhisattva asks about, he was a bodhisattva named destroyer of the non-virtuous. And he asked the Buddha, and by the way, and this is important for tonight, in the opening of the sutra, the Buddha left where he was hanging out and went into the city into the big city of Rajgriha. And when he was in the city, he encountered this bodhisattva who was a householder bodhisattva, asked about how do bodhisattvas kind of generate these arrays of virtues? How do they purify Buddha lands? And that was the theme, or that was the idea of last week and the week before. You can go back and check those out if you want to kind of know more about that. But that's where we left that was the Buddha down or the Buddha had just left the city and returned back to where he was. And so these bodhisattva, this bodhisattva in the first part, he asks about Buddha lands and particularly how to purify Buddha lands. And the Buddha gives that bodhisattva a long answer. But that sort of concluded this first part. And now we're going to get into a new part. And I said this a few uh, Sundays ago, that there was a part of this sutra that I was that I really wanted to share with everybody that it's so beautiful. Tonight's the night. <laughs> so you're in luck because this is sort of one of my it's just so beautiful. But there's a few things you need to know ahead of time so that I could just read it and you can just hear it and experience it because I don't want to interrupt it. I want you to know what's going on. It's very important you kind of understand the language. So in terms of Buddha lands, in terms of the purification of a Buddha land, the term saha or saha, sorry, saha is the word for Shakyamuni Buddha's Buddha land. And that's a little different actually than planet earth or even in a way where we are. 
in a way. S meaning you might think you're on earth. I think I'm on earth. I think I'm here. But it's the Saha or Saha world isn't maybe exactly this. Exactly. In other words, tonight is about defining this Buddha land of, of our Buddha, of Shakyamuni, the historical Buddha. So it's about that. And if you've ever been interested or even heard about and then been curious, if you've ever been interested in Pure Land Buddhism, tonight's the night. This is the most beautiful, clearest, clearest description of what these Buddha lands are actually all about. So we're going to read about it. There's really only one other thing you kind of need to know about. Uh, I guess two things. Let me, uh, two things. The first, though, I've already told you about it. In fact, I've been preparing you for tonight for weeks now. They're going to mention the, and well, I'm going to change the language when I read it because I often do that, but they're going to talk about voice hearers and solitary Buddhas, Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas. And, you know, I've talked a lot about those terms, even in this series, so I don't want to really repeat that idea, but just let it be known that the Shravaka, the voice hearer, is kind of a term, a Mahayana term for a monastic, a renunciant of the early Hinayana path, who is considered a follower, a student, a voice hearer, but in some ways still basically kind of part of the cult of the Buddha, like still kind of in a club, in a religion even. And so in the Mahayana, you don't really want to be a Shravaka. You don't want to just be one member of a club of Buddhists. So there's an option, the Bodhisattva path, to become a Buddha. And you could actually even understand dependent origination, become awakened, and be what's called a Pratekya Buddha, a solitary enlightened one. You're not part of the club. You're not part of the, the gang and all of that. So you're not a Shravaka you've gone off to basically live in a cave for the rest of your existence in your wisdom, in your knowledge, in your awakened state. But the shortcoming of the Pratekya Buddha is that the Pratekya Buddha doesn't share, doesn't turn the Dharma wheel is what they would say, doesn't share the teachings, figures these things out. And it may be that the Pratekya Buddha has no upaya, actually understands emptiness, dependent origination, all of these things, but can't actually describe it. So the Pratekya Buddha can, can sit <laughs> awakened and be awakened, but can't share it in that way. The Bodhisattva's going for Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, which is the enlightened state of a Buddha, a fully enlightened Buddha, not just a Pratekya Buddha. And what makes a fully enlightened Buddha a fully enlightened Buddha is that they turn the Dharma wheel or share the teachings. Those two terms are going to come up a few times. So I just wanted to remind you of that in terms of like, why is the sutra maybe putting down the Shravakas and the Pratekya Buddhas? That's why. The only other thing I need to tell you is a language thing. Um, you know, if you've been coming, you know, I'm reading from a English translation from the Tibetan. Uh, and we, uh, somewhere there's a link, uh, hopefully there's a link, but there's, this is online. So I'm gonna read from the Tibetan. Um, and the Tibetan's of course, its own language in that way. It's very, at least, in a sutra like this, it's very related to Sanskrit. But I just want to mention that a fully enlightened Buddha usually has the very long title of Tathagata Arhat Samyak Sambuddha. Thus come one, worthy one, incomparably enlightened one. So that's the Tathagata Arhat 
Samyak Sambutta. This Tibetan translator does something kind of a little weird with the, with the English translation of Tathagata. It, it, includes the word blessed all the time in front of the word Tathagata, or not even the word Tathagata, but they translate it as thus gone one, and then it's the blessed thus gone one. I'm going to just keep it as Tathagata Arhat Samyak Sambutta. That phrase is going to come up often, and I didn't want you to be thrown by it. So I just want you to know it's one of those big long titles for a fully enlightened Buddha. But just a quick word on that, or just a quick word on that word, tathagata. So tathagata, usually translated as thus come one, thusly arrived one. But because of the peculiarities of Sanskrit, depending on where you put the emphasis on that word tathagata or tathagata, it could mean thus come one or thus gone one. And of course, if you're just reading Sanskrit, it has this beautiful play between those two ideas, where if you read it one way, it's thus come. If you read it another way, it's thus gone. And if you understand thusness, tathata, then it's kind of, you know, it's all the same idea in that way. My point is, tathagata or tathagata, either arriving of thusness or sort of departing thus. Again, it, either way, it speaks to tathata, which is the root of the word tathagata. Tathata is suchness as it is -ness. And the only thing that I, like a, a big seed I wanna plant before we get into the sutra is that the only way for something to be thus, to be such, if, if, is if it's right in your face and you're experiencing it. That's such, this is such, hi, <laughs> this is such. And so what I mean is, is that tathata or suchness is never abstract. <laughs> it's never in the past in that way. It's always pointing to the, the to presence. And again, the only way for presence to be is to be present. <laughs> so keep that in mind as this reading goes along and this idea of the tathagata keeps coming up. Okay, that's all I got to say. Otherwise, especially if you've come to a few Sundays so far as I've been building up to tonight, um, everything should be really, I think, crystal clear. So um, on that note, tonight's reading, I would say has, well, dep depending on how far I get, it, um, it kind of has an opening the really the main part, and then maybe a third part. I'll pause after the opener just to make sure we're all on the same page. So once again, the Buddha's been to town, given a Dharma teaching, and gone to King Ajatashatru's house, had lunch. Uh, and actually, I think he was teaching the Dharma, so he didn't actually get to eat lunch. And so it says, rather than breaking the rule of eating after midday, the Buddha returned to Mount Rajgriha, or sorry, Mount Gridrakuta, the vulture's peak. It goes on to say, later that afternoon, after the Blessed One, the Bhagavan, the World Honored One, after the World Honored One had arisen from his meditation, he went to the vulture's peak, to the king of mountains, and there he sat upon the seat that had been prepared for him in order to teach the Dharma. Then venerable Shariputra and the other great voice hearers, Shravakas, likewise arose from their meditations and went to where the, the world honored one was seated on Vulture's Peak, the king of mountains. They bowed their heads, circumambulated him three times, 
and then sat to one side. Manju Shri Bodhisattva also arose from his meditation and came before the world honored one, surrounded and preceded by 42,000 gods, all of whom had entered the Mahayana, the great vehicle. They bowed their heads at the feet of the world honored one and sat to one side. The Bodhisattva, that Mahasattva, that great being, Maitreya, the future Buddha, also came before the world honored one, surrounded and preceded by 1,000 other Bodhisattvas. They bowed their heads at the feet of the world honored one and sat to one side. The Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, that great being, powerful lion's roar also came before the world honored one, surrounded and preceded by 500 other bodhisattvas. They bowed their heads at the feet of the, uh, of the world honored one and sat to one side. King Ajata Shatru also went to the world honored one's location on the vulture's peak, surrounded and preceded by his four divisions of the army. They also bowed their heads at the feet of the world honored one and sat to one side. Finally, billions of citizens of the city of Rajgriha also arrived at the world honored one's location on the vulture's peak. They also bowed their heads and sat to one side. Then, through the power of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra arose from his seat, draped his shawl over one shoulder, knelt with his right knee on the ground, and with his palms reverentially joined together, he bowed toward the world honored one and requested, world honored one, given that while you were in the middle of the city of Rajgriha, the, the world honored one taught a sutra in response to a request by the bodhisattva, a mahasattva, destroyer of the non-virtuous, in order to teach on the arrays of virtues of Buddha lands of bodhisattvas, those great mahasattvas. How do bodhisattva mahasattvas practicing this no longer regress from the path to Anuttara Samyak Sambuddhi? How do they master omniscience? How do they defeat the hordes of Mara? How do they refute non-Buddhist teachings? How do they avoid being overwhelmed by afflictions? How do they refine the arrays of virtues of Buddha lands? How do they perfect their aspiration? How do they avoid the decline of insight? How do they arrive at the level of Buddhahood? How do they avoid the levels of voice hearer shravakas and solitary enlightened Pratekya Buddhas? How do they practice the six paramitas? How do they turn the Dharma wheel while they are still bodhisattvas who have not yet attained omniscience? How do they benefit countless innumerable beings? Oh, world honored one, all the noble sons and daughters gathered in this assembly are passionate about awakening and would be gladdened and overjoyed to hear such teachings directly from the world honored one. Being so gladdened and overjoyed, they will earnestly accomplish what they have heard. Okay, so that's our opener. The only thing I want to mention, because it's not something I get to talk about a lot, it doesn't always happen like this in sutras. There's something very special in Mahayana sutras about the vulture's peak. Like when you're reading sutras and you hear that the Buddha was in Shravasti, in Anatha Pindika's park, right? classic place for the Buddha to be. It's significant 
when he's in Shravasti. It's significant when he's in Rajgriha. It's significant when he's in all of these different places. And I mean significant allegorically speaking in terms of Mahayana Sutras where it's symbolic of something, each of these places. And the vulture's peak is particularly a special location for sutras. The one thing that I kind of just want to say, and then I'll get to the reading because I'm excited about the reading. The way that you can kind of read it is, is the way that I read this. Basically, the idea is, is when the Buddha went into Rajgriha, got encountered by a householder bodhisattva, went to King Ajatashatru's house. Those teachings were sort of for the people of Rajgriha. Remember, it was a householder bodhisattva. And so what we're getting here, remember the um, Shariputra it was, remember Shariputra said, when you were in the city, you gave a teaching on the arrays of virtues of Buddha lands. Will, will you give us a teaching on the arrays of virtues of Buddha lands? And what I want to say is, is that there seems to be this thing going on where the Buddha went down to the city and taught the arrays of virtues of Buddha lands one way to the people. But when we're on Mount Gridrakuta, when we're on the vulture's peak, and Maitreya's there and Manjushri's there, this is sort of going to be a teaching at a higher level. So it's going to be the same idea, but this, like, this is for the Mahasattvas. So I just wanted to point that out. And that's pretty much the case most of the time, that when the Buddha's on the vulture's peak, it's like serious, it's mystical. If, if, you're a, if you know world religion at all, especially or Christianity, the vulture's peak is like the Buddhist Gol Golgotha right? The, the, the mountain where Jesus was crucified, that Mount Golgotha has this mysticism to it in the Christian tradition. Similar vibe is going on with Vulture's Peak, where it's a very mystical place. So everybody has gathered to hear the Buddha teach on purifying Buddha lands and these arrays of virtues. Then the world honored one thought. This setting is not beautiful enough for me to give such a Dharma teaching. By the way, the Chinese reads this setting or that this teaching is not only for those gathered here. So it actually in the Chinese, it's not about it not being beautiful enough. It's about I got to share this with more people than just you. <laughs> so, therefore, the Buddha thinks, I shall perform a miracle whereby I will emit trillions of light rays in each of the 10 directions. Each light ray will then illuminate trillions of Buddha lands, the sun and the moon in those Buddha lands will become invisible, eclipsed by the light. And they will no longer, the sun and the moon will no longer appear to the physical eye. Likewise, the light of the gods will no longer be visible, nor will the lights of Nagas, Yakshas, the lights of jewels, the lights of lightning, the lights of fire, stars, or any other thing. In countless limitless worlds throughout the 10 directions, this light will instantly illuminate all of the surrounding mountains, the greater surrounding mountains, the Mucha Linda mountains, the greater Mucha Linda mountains, the Mount Merus, the Black Mountains, and all other mountain ranges, as well as the buildings and forests and jungles. I will, I will perform a miracle such as this. Then, as the World Honored One emitted such lights, he spoke in a clear voice that was heard 
in countless, limitless worlds throughout the 10 directions. At that time, in a world called totally illuminated, located to the east of this Buddha realm, past Buddha realms numbering 84 times the number of grains of sand in the Ganges River. There is a Tathagata Arahat Samyak Sambutta named King of Splendor, who is still present, alive, and teaching the Dharma there. In that place, not even the categories of Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas are even known, for that Buddha realm was populated exclusively with bodhisattvas. Each assembly of bodhisattvas in that Buddha realm contained a billion non-regressing bodhisattva mahasattvas. And there was a bodhisattva Mahasattva in that Buddha realm named Elevated Dharma. This Bodhisattva was called Elevated Dharma because he ascended into the sky to the height of seven palm trees as the Tathagata, King of Splendor, was teaching the Dharma, surrounded by his Sangha of Bodhisattvas. And as that bodhisattva's body disappeared, he gave a dharma teaching on the Vajra Dharani words called the Bodhisattva Pitika or Bodhisattva Basket. The other bodhisattvas then thought, all dharmas are merely sounds. Why? Even though this noble bodhisattva's body doesn't appear, his voice resounds and he speaks, yet his physical body is invisible. So visible form must be the same nature as sound and all phenomena must also be of the same nature as form. Understanding this, countless bodhisattvas gained the patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all dharmas. This is how that bodhisattva elevated dharma received his name. When the bodhisattva elevated dharma witnessed the great burst of illumination and heard the clear voice, he went before the Tathagata king of splendor. He bowed his head at the feet of the world honored one and sat to one side. The bodhisattva, mahasattva, elevated dharma, then asked the world honored one, blessed one, what are the causes and conditions of this great illumination that has manifested in our world? And this booming and the booming sound of this clear voice, world honored one, I've never seen such a light. The Tathagata, Arahat, Samyak Sambutta, King of Splendor, answered the Bodhisattva Mahasattva elevated Dharma saying, Noble one, in a Buddha realm called Saha, which means enduring, which is located to the west of here past Buddha realms numbering 84 times the number of grains of sand in the Ganges River. There is a Tathagata, Arahat, Samyak Sambutta named Shakyamuni, who is still present and alive. That Tathagata is gathering bodhisattvas from immeasurably many countless trillions of worlds throughout the 10 directions. In order to explain the Dharma, all the pores of his body have emitted this light and the sound of his clear voice. The Bodhisattva Mahasattva elevated Dharma then announced to the 
to the blessed Tathagata, king of splendor. World, honored one, I am going to the Saha world to behold and venerate and honor the Tathagata Arhat Samyak Sambuddhi Shakyamuni and to see this Sangha of great bodhisattvas and to hear the Dharma. That world honored one responded, noble one, if you know that the time is ripe, then go. And as quickly as an athlete can extend and it contract his arm, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva elevated Dharma surrounded and preceded by 63 million Bodhisattvas disappeared from that Buddha realm and arrived in the Saha world. The Bodhisattva elevated Dharma then entered into the Bodhisattva Samadhi concentration called adorned with every adornment. As soon as the Bodhisattva elevated Dharma entered into that Samadhi, the entire 3000 great thousand world system was filled with a great mass of flowers up to everyone's knees. The sound of hundreds of thousands of instruments resounded, and the 3,000 great thousand world system was beautifully adorned by the raising of parasols, banners and flags, scented with the finest of incenses, such that it was no different from the heavenly realm of those making use of others' emanations in terms of its divine enjoyments. Once the Bodhisattva elevated Dharma had displayed these miracles, he and all the other Bodhisattvas approached and arrived before the blessed Shakyamuni. They, they bowed their heads at the feet of the world honored one, circumambulated him three times and sat to one side on the seats of lotus flowers that had appeared in accordance with their aspirations. Also, at that moment, in a Buddha realm called Vimala, stainless, located to the south, past trillions of Buddha realms, numbering 96 times the number of grains of sand in the Ganges River, there was a Tathagata, Arahat, Samyak Sambutta, named displaying lion-like power, who is also presently there, alive and well, and teaching the Dharma, surrounded by a boundless Sangha of Bodhisattvas. There were no Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas in that Buddha realm. In that Buddha realm lived a Bodhisattva Mahasattva named Ratnapani, and why was this bodhisattva called Ratnapani? Whenever this noble one wanted to teach the Dharma to beings in other Buddha realms, he would stretch out his right hand and sweep it over as many Buddha realms as he wished, whereby from his hand, the precious sounds Buddha, Dharma, Sangha would resound. The precious sounds, Dana, Shila, Kshanti, Virya, Dhyana, Pranya would resound. The precious sounds, Metta, Karuna, Mudita, Upeksha would resound. These and trillions of other different precious sounds of other aspects of the Dharma would resound. That is why that Bodhisattva is called Ratnapani. The Bodhisattva Ratnapani had also witnessed the great burst of illumination and had also heard the clear voice. So he went before the blessed Tathagata displaying lion-like power. He bowed his head at the feet of the world honored one and sat to one side. Sitting there, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Ratnapani 
then asked the blessed Tathagata, displaying lion-like power, world honored one, what are the causes and conditions of this great illumination that has manifested in our world, as well as this booming sound of a clear voice? That Tathagata answered, noble one, in a Buddha realm called Saha, enduring, located to the north, past trillions of Buddha realms, numbering 96 times the number of grains of sand in the Ganges River, there is a Tathagata, Arahat Samyak Sambutta, named Shakyamuni, who is still present, alive and well, and teaching the Dharma. That Tathagata is gathering bodhisattvas from immeasurable many countless worlds throughout the 10 directions. In order to explain this sacred Dharma, all the pores of his body emit this light and the sound of his clear voice. Also, the Tathagata Shakyamuni intends to give the Dharma teaching called the Arrays of Virtues of Buddha Lands. A limitless number of bodhisattvas there will acquire those arrays of virtues of those Buddha lands. The Bodhisattva Ratnipani proclaimed to the Tathagata displaying lion-like power, world honored one, I'm going to the Saha world to behold, venerate and honor the Tathagata Arahat Samyak Sambutta Shakyamuni and to see that great gathering of bodhisattvas and hear the Dharma teachings. That Tathagata responded, noble one, it may not be suitable for you to go there. Why? That world is filled with dukkha, suffering, since one encounters beings there who are immersed in greed, anger, and delusion. The Bodhisattva Ratnapani replied to the blessed Tathagata displaying lion-like power. World honored one, what greater purpose does the Tathagata Arahat Samyak Sambuddha Shakyamuni see such that the world a world honored one such as he takes on the responsibility for such a degenerate Buddha land, although there are other much more pure Buddha lands. That Tathagata answered, noble one, long ago, that Tathagata Arhat Samyak Sambutta aspired that no matter the cost, he would fully awaken to Anuttara Samyak Sambutta, Sambuddhahood, and teach the Dharma among degenerate beings. Noble one, the Tathagata Shakyamuni possesses great compassion to such a degree as that. The Bodhisattva Mahasattva Ratnapani declared to the blessed Tathagata displaying lion-like power, world honored one, I am going to the Saha world to behold, venerate, and honor the blessed Tathagata Shakyamuni. And why? By developing such great compassion and by embracing such a degenerate Buddha land, the blessed Tathagata Shakyamuni is engaged in hardship. Such a Tathagata Arhat Samyak Sambutta does not easily appear. It is, it is very rare to be able to meet such a one. That Tathagata displaying lion-like power responded, noble one, well, if you know that the time is right, then go. Noble one, set out for that Buddha realm, but be careful with whom you speak. For even the bodhisattvas born in that Buddha realm, Saha, are difficult to associate with. And the other beings there, 
are fierce and angry. The Bodhisattva Ratnapani replied to the blessed Tathagata displaying lion-like power. Blessed one, I could speak with those beings in that Buddha realm who are attached or aggressive. However, world honored one, given that I have neither attachment nor aggression, why would I speak to them? World honored one, I'm eager to be patient. Even if in future kalpas, beings should scold me or ridicule me or intimidate me or beat me, flinging earth or even weapons at me, I would not become malicious toward anyone. The blessed Tathagata displaying lion-like power then addressed his retinue of bodhisattvas. Noble children, if any of you are eager to master kashanti, patience, like that bodhisattva Ratnapani, you too should accompany this noble one to the Saha world. The moment that blessed one had said this, 92,000 bodhisattvas in the assembly proclaimed with a single voice, world honored one, we are eager to master patience. Just like that bodhisattva Ratnapani, we shall all go to the Saha world. Then with a single intention, the bodhisattva Ratnapani surrounded and preceded by those 92,000 bodhisattvas disappeared from that Buddha realm and arrived here in this Buddha realm. The Bodhisattva Ratnapani then wondered, what kind of miracle shall I perform to go before the blessed Shakyamuni and bring immeasurable beings happiness? The Bodhisattva Mahasattva Ratnapani then held his right hand over this 3,000 great thousand world system, and from it arose food for those who wanted food, drink for those who wanted drink, and likewise mounts, clothing, gold, silver, barrel, pearl, conch, crystal, and coral for all those who wanted such things. Beings who desired and yearned for the Dharma heard the Dharma coming from his hand whereby limitless beings understood the Dharma. Beings who were afflicted by or suffered from any number of diseases regained perfect health. Such were the miracles Ratnapani performed. And once the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Ratnapani had displayed such miracles, he went before the Blessed Tathagata Shakyamuni together with the Bodhisattvas. Arriving there, they bowed their heads at the feet of the, of the world honored one, circumambulated him three times, and sat to one side on seats of lotus flowers that had appeared in accordance with their aspirations. Okay. I'm going to pause there. Excellent. So. Any ideas, questions, comments? While I, while I hydrate. I mean, I hope it was clear. <laughs> so that's a Pure Land Sutra. Very, very much so. And so one of the, so the first thing that I'm very excited about in terms of the, the way that this reads, I'm, it's really special because in Mahayana sutras, you hear this a lot. This like, oh, you know, 62 million grains of sand to the east, there's a world and there's a Buddha there and it's all lapis lazuli or whatever there. And you hear those things. And this sutra really kind of starts to tie a lot of those things together in a way that I think is really 
well, beautiful and understandable in that way, especially with that. So I'll start there. There's so many things I want to point at, but just that beautiful, funny thing about how, you know, all the way that way, there's a world. And then when we are in that world, they say, oh yeah, all the way that way, there's a world, right? And so that's a funny thing going on there, right? That type of relationship between those things, right? And the next thing I wanna point out, so this goes on for a while. I, I read to you two, I will probably read one more tonight is my plan. Yeah, I'll definitely, I'll read one more. But the first one was about, well, first of all, let's get our imagery right, right? It's this wild idea where the Buddha's like, you know what? There's not enough people here. Or in the Tibetan, he says, you know, this isn't beautiful enough. And so from every pore of his body, he emits these light rays that go in all 10 directions. So north, south, east, and west, the ordinal directions, the cardinal directions, and up and down. So those are the 10 directions. So in every direction, he puts out this light that's accompanied by this great voice. And then these bodhisattvas in these other lands see this light, hear this voice, and are like, what's going on, right? So that's the basic idea of what's going on. Like, to, to reiterate what happened. But first we go east. I believe it's east, right? So yeah, first we go east, then we go south, and next we're about to go west. And then indeed we're gonna go north and we're basically gonna go all 10 directions. Another aspect of these sutras that I find very interesting, it's something that I would love to see other people either write about or talk about. It's something that I think is really, really interesting. And it's basically, once you really start reading all of this, it becomes what I would call a literary mandala. Yes, they're, they're talking about the different directions, but in your mind, as you're reading this, they are mapping out a mandala. And if you're paying attention, you understand that you're sitting in the middle of that mandala. And so as a visualization, as a meditation, as a contemplation, as an exercise, in reading these sutras, you're creating this kind of visual mental mandala that is, at least in the tradition, especially the Tibetan tradition, is kind of purifying your mind realm <laughs> as you go through that. So as I, when I read the next section and then next week when we finish this up, just be paying attention to that kind of construction of a, men, of a literary mandala. Because you know, mandalas are usually, of course, visual. So it's interesting to read a mandala. So, so there's that. Let's, let's talk a little bit about, and I, I, I almost wanted to stop, but I, I'm glad I didn't. So the, so the first the first bodhisattva is sort of preparatory, I would say. Like the light goes there, the bodhisattva sees the light, asks the Buddha about a light, we hear about Saha world, the bodhisattva is like, I wanna go. <laughs> and the Buddha says, sure, if you think it's the right time. And then they all go. The bodhisattva then performs a miracle that beautifies the Saha world. And that kind of pertains to the Buddha saying, it's not beautiful enough here for me to teach this sutra. So he invites these bodhisattvas and then they perform these miracles and it beautifies the place. It also populates the vulture's peak, which then 
makes the Chinese make sense, where the Buddha said, there's not enough people here. So two things linguistically. First, I, and I meant to mention it at the beginning, I apologize. Saha. So Saha means it's usually translated as endurance. They translate it as enduring. But you, at least from the second Bodhisattva, Ratnapani section, we start to get a sense of why, why this Buddha land is called Saha. <laughs> It's full of dukkha. It's 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 you know it's a degenerate Buddha land, you know, and so that is sort of this idea of the Saha world, that it's a Buddha land, but it's a little rough around around <laughs> a little rough around the edges in that way. So that's what Saha means, endurance. Then I wanted to mention about our Bodhisattva Ratnapani. So this is the much more interesting, complicated um, bodhisattva. And it's where we get this kind of interesting thing where the Buddha there is like, ah, you might not want to go there. And well, let me save the teaching. I want to speak on the teaching because I think it's such a powerful teaching. But linguistically, let's just have a little fun real quick. I need to tell you, so our bodhisattva elevated dharma, right? Um, that was the, the, the first one. Or no, that's, yeah, that was our first bodhisattva. Elevated dharma. He gave this interesting dharma talk while floating in the air and making himself invisible. And the whole crowd actually comes to understand emptiness and develops the patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all phenomena by realizing that all phenomena or all dharmas are mere sounds. And they realize this because they hear elevated dharma, they hear bodhisattva elevated dharma talking, but they don't see him. And from that, they come to this understanding that all dharmas are like that. And this idea that, and, and it's not exactly clear, at least to me. Well, I mean, it is, a little, it is a little clear, but let me tear this apart. So as his body disappeared, he gave a dharma teaching. And the Tibetan here says he gave a Dharma teaching on the Vajra Dharani words called the Bodhisattva basket. And, uh, you know, that's a really interesting line. <laughs> There's a lot of interesting words in that line. <laughs> Vajra, Dharani, Bodhisattva basket. Like, these are interesting words. And just because we do have a little bit of time, I just want you to know that the Chinese, once again, makes this much clearer. And it's unfortunate, These the translator of the Tibetan, they say in the footnotes, whoever translated this says, oh yeah, I don't know Chinese, so I didn't refer to the Chinese. They say that, so fine. I wish they would have, because the Chinese is really clear it actually is about how there is a, a dharma door, a dharma paraya, this dharma door that is, it says there's a dharma door that is a bodhisattva garba, a bodhisattva treasury. And it's called, this is what the Chinese says, and it's called... Dharani Vajrapada. Pada means a word or a phrase. And so there's this Bodhisattva basket that's called this Dharani Vajra word. And not that that helps at all, but what does help though is that if there, so if you have the Tibetan, 
you'll notice that it says that the Bodhisattva gave a Dharma talk on the Vajradharani words called, and then in italics, the Bodhisattva basket, as if that is the special word, as if that's the mantra. But the Chinese makes it clear that the mantra are the words Dharani Vajrapada. Now, Dharanis are these mnemonic devices, right? Vajras are Vajras, right? So this is a kind of mnemonic device of words with a Vajra element to it, kind of a thing. We're not exactly, I'm not exactly sure again what, what that means, but in, if, we, if I just wanted to say something about it, I'll say that the realization that the crowd has that all dharmas are mere sounds, you could also read that as all dharmas are mere words. And that would get closer to an understanding of how the audience came to a realization of the patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all dharmas, because they realized every single phenomena, any given Dharma is always only just a word. So that's a powerful teaching in that way. Um, now let's get to the real kind of teaching, especially now that the time just slips away. So the real teaching for me is the Ratnapani section. And it has to do with that beautiful dialogue where the Buddha says, you might not want to go there. It's full of dukkha. And that the people there are full of greed, anger, and delusion, full of hostility. It's going to be tough. And there's this, it's my favorite line of the whole thing, where he says, where this Bodhisattva says, well, we're alone in one. I could, I could speak with those beings in that Buddha realm who are attached and full of aggression. However, world honored one, given that I have neither attachment nor aggression, why would I speak to them? I'm eager to practice patience, right? So that's a funny line. Like in my opinion, that's a funny line, but it's a really interesting thing. And so in order to kind of start to actually make this the Dharma talk on purifying Buddha lands. I want, I, and I'm hoping that you just got this, like that you just heard it and you were like, oh, that's beautiful. That's awesome. But I still feel obliged to, to say it. It's an interesting twist. And it's in particular, it's an interesting twist where they do this thing where it's where they say, where he says to his Buddha, Ratnapani says, why would Shakyamuni, well, of all of the Buddha lands in the multiverse, why would he take over a degenerate Buddha land? And of course, that, that Buddha, that Tathagata says, well, because he has, well, he made the commitment, he made the vow, but he has that much compassion. And all of a sudden, the Ratnapani crew are really inspired by that level of commitment, that level of, of patience, that level of, of compassion. And that prompts them to want to go even more. Like even though we've been told it's full of dukkha, even though it's full of aggressive people, the bodhisattvas are even more fired up to go now. And then the Buddha says, hey, if anybody wants to practice patience, you should go with Ratnapani to the Saha world. If you're like me, then when you read that, something shifts. And what shifts, well, your disposition towards your, this Buddha land. And what I mean is, is that it's not that all of a sudden it gets more beautiful per se. It's that it's like, you're like, oh, it's a great place to practice. It's a perfect place to practice. That's awesome. And then, you know, I think that not to get too weird, 
not to get too weird, but as far as like, how can I put this without getting too weird? What I want to say is, is that, you know, there's this idea. Oh, I can, I can put it in, I can put it in my own uh, words. <laughs> so I often give the teaching about Buddhism as it relates to reincarnation. And what I talk about is how for a tradition like the, the, the Jains, for example, the Jain tradition, or a lot of other Indian traditions that are into reincarnation, which is kind of all most Indian philosophical and religious traditions are into the idea of reincarnation. But the general view of reincarnation is that that your, your station in life, your position in life is sort of punishment for your past karma. Now, it might be not punishment because you might have a fancy house and you might have a, and you might consider that great. And then that's a reward for past karma. But the idea is whether it's good or bad, one's station in life, the general sense of it is that it's all of this past karma that has kind of mounted up behind us that has led us to being born in the specific station that we're born into. That's the general way of understanding karma as it pertains to reincarnation in a general Indian context. The Buddha comes along and sees it very differently. And insofar as there is reincarnation in Buddhism, and there is reincarnation in Buddhism, it's just tricky. But insofar as there is reincarnation, the Buddha doesn't see it as consequences of past action. The Buddha actually sees it as you, you got reborn here because you wanted to. You, you actually like it here. You like desires and things like that. And so it's not that you got kind of punished and got back here. You actually at some point stood before Yama, basically judge of the dead, and said, no, I want to go back. <laughs> and Yama was like, here you go. And so from a Buddhist point of view, we're not being punished or rewarded for our past actions, we're getting exactly what we are clinging to, wanting in that way. And it's a present, it's a present doing, not from the past. It's what allows for us to get out of here, by the way. <laughs> so that's a slight shift in the Buddhist view of it, that we've sort of made a kind of a choice to come back. Now it might have been and probably in a sense, a misinformed choice <laughs> in, I mean, as far as suffering and attachment goes, because you have signed up for more suffering in that way. But regardless, my point is, is that from that Buddhist point of view where, where we've sort of stood before Yama and decided to come back, Rather than seeing the Saha world here as a kind of hell on earth or something like that, a kind of Gnostic view of this as like a fallen realm, I think the idea is, is that there's a, sh there's a potential shift going on here, which is the shift from like the shift from asking yourself why is this happening to me? And this sort of, you know, a kind of victim mentality of, of, in that way. And what this sutra is kind of doing is trying to shift your disposition towards this realm and trying to get you to see it as a great opportunity, not as a misfortune at all. And so what I'm kind of getting at, again, not to try to sound too weird, but in your bodhisattva-hoodness, 
you saw the light, you heard the voice, and that's why you're here to practice patience. Just like Ratni Pana, Ratna Pani and crew. And so the sutra is trying to get you to see, it kind of get you to see it that way, which would be a different way. And that is kind of purifying a Buddha realm. Because when you get stuck in the rut of this sucks, this sucks, this sucks, you wake up in the morning and it sucks. <laughs> That's kind of the idea of Pure Land Buddhism, that if you're thinking constantly this sucks, <laughs> versus if you're like, this is a great opportunity, I've come to practice patience, then it, it's, it's different. So, <laughs> yeah, Tanya. Yeah, I was kind of um, shocked is too strong of a word, but when the Bodhisattva said, why would I want to go there? I'm, I'm, I'm practicing patience. I was like, and I'm not trying to set myself up to be some sort of like, you know, but I was like, that's the perfect place to go if you want to practice patience. No, that's what he meant. Well, no, but when the Bodhisattva was like, I don't want to go there. Why would I go there? No, he says, I do want to go. Oh, but before, didn't he before earlier say he didn't want to go? Okay, then I misheard that. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, yeah, and if I misread it, I apologize. No, no, the idea is he says, no, nah, like when the Buddha warns him and says, you may not want to go, it's full of dukkha. He says, no, I want to go. I'm eager to practice patience. It's what we, it's what I came to do. Yeah, no. Yeah, I misheard that too. Uh, ah, darn, I blew it. I'm glad you clarified it. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to go back to something that, that I thought that I thought at first was unrelated, but now I think it is related, which is why the two different translations, one is uh, this land isn't beautiful enough, and one is this land doesn't have enough people in it. Like those, it's not like just two people totally differently interpreting something, right? That's like, those are related. Like the more people there are to hear a teaching, the more beautiful it is. Is that what it means? They are the same idea. Okay. Absolutely. I think it really just has to do with the fact that the Tibetan is called Manju Shri's Buddha Land's Array of Virtues. And that is about adornments and about beautification. Whereas the Chinese, it's the Manjushri Vyakaranya Sutra, and it's about Manjushri's prediction of enlightenment. So even their title shows that they have a slightly different emphasis. And that emphasis plays out, I think, in the way that that line is translated. But I know you're totally right, though, that it is actually saying the same thing in that way. Well, and it's related to what you were just saying, that your, your opportunity here is to, you know, it, it, it is to help as many people as possible. So if you're a bodhisattva, right? That's that's your whole. It's your whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is, and that's certainly you know that was part of the session we did on the vow. That yeah. that's it's this really altruistic vow in that way. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Tanya. I just want to say I don't know. I got really excited when I heard the word. Vajra and Dharani together, <laughs> you know, and then I was thinking about, it was just like, whoosh, you know, and like, you know, Dharani can also be like a magical thing too, right? And like having that with Vajra just sounds like, you know, like insane synergy kind of like perk up when you hear that kind of thing. I don't know. It just kind of struck me. It sure. It struck me the same way. I. And it's unfortunate that the translations are kind of a little conflicting. It gets, it's tricky to get to what they're really getting at. So, but I too was excited by the, the juxtaposition of those words. Yeah, yeah, it's very striking. Any other questions, comments, or answers about this? Uh, Michael, I just wanted to hear the weird version, but um, it, it, it I know you don't mean it this way, but yeah, I'm, I'm just, it's sort of a like, oh, this sucks for you? Well, you chose it. So, you know, good luck. It's, you know, uh, it, it, which it isn't, it, it, that's one reading. And then the other reading is like, look for the opportunities 
for what you're up to anyways. And rather than focusing on how hard it is or that like it could be easier or something, it's like, um, but yeah, that's an interesting, uh, it's, I guess, yeah, I have, I struggle because I, I'm, I don't care about reincarnation. I mean, fine, reincarnation or not, it's not really like, whatever. Okay, great. I mean, I hope I have good hair, but the, you know, it's, it, yeah, it, to me, it's, it's, it's a way to deal with like, what is the point of this? And, you know, like, also, what is the point of this? And I don't know that it needs a point. And the Bodhisattva path is, is, you know, it doesn't necessarily need reincarnation. Um, it's kind of sweeter because, you know, you get another shot at it if you biffed it, but like, you know, fine, you know, now you have a purpose. So, but uh, yeah, I wanted, I wanted to hear the weird version and I'll let you respond. Thank you. Yeah, look, I, 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 I want to talk two things. First thing, um, d, uh, good, <laughs> good comments. Good, good uh, in that way. This idea of, I want to address what you said because you, it's like you caught me and I want to be clear. This idea of, oh, this sucks. Well, you chose it. I want to be very, very clear about something. The sutra doesn't say that. I, as a Dharma teacher, is trying to, um, as skillfully as I could, sort of interpret a way of reading it. And what I mean is, is that I would never say that to anybody. The sutra is not saying that. The sutra is not saying, oh, you think you're having a hard time? Well, you chose it. Not at all. So I want to make that really clear that I was interpreting the sutra in that way. And I'm not saying that either. It's just sort of that. So there's that. Now let's talk about reincarnation. So I hear you. And the thing about it is, I, you, you've probably heard me say this before, Brendan, but for, for others, I want to say it. If you're not into reincarnation, doesn't matter. Because the beauty of the Dharma, the beauty of this teaching is that well is that it doesn't matter here's what i mean by that if we understand and not fully understand but just understand the the teaching of no self like what that actually means and is pointing at then here's the thing about it. So teaching of no self, let's hold on. It's right here. Let's hold on to it. The idea is, is this, if you understand that idea, then the continuity of your experience between let's say last week, now and next week, or let's say a year ago, now a year from now, or let's say 10 now and 10 years in the future. The idea is, is that you, Brendan, or whoever, you might be doing things now, today, to try to make tomorrow better for yourself. You might be trying to do things and set things up for yourself a year from now or 10 years from now. And the idea about it is, is that, well, I thought there was no self. Here's the thing about it. There is no self, but the Buddha is fully aware of how it seems that there is a self. And part of that feeling as if there is a self is feeling that, that that being in 10 years is me, just like that being 10 years ago was me. <laughs> that sounds like a self. <laughs> 10 years, ten, a 20 year self. Now, what I'm talking about, or my, my kind of what I wanted to mention as far as what Brendan said was, 
that's the tricky thing about it is that if we understand that there's no self, then 10 years, 10, it's, it, there's no self. From the Buddhist point of view, the delusion and the attachment to the delusion of self stretches back not just 10 years, not just 40, I forget years, but lifetimes. And the thing about it is, is that even though there's no self, I can, re I can remember last week. I can remember a year ago. I can remember 10 years ago. And the idea is, is yes, that's the Buddha will say, yeah, there is a, 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 a chain of karmic reactions that are, have led to this moment. And so there's a relationship between 10 years ago and this, and that's why you can remember it. But if you're identifying with that from 10 years ago, that identification is called a self. That's a self. The idea that that was you 10 years ago, and it'll be you 10 years from now. So if you're attached to a self, guess what you get? That, that sense of the whole thing. And I want to say it again. I can remember 10 years ago. And what the Buddha said is, yeah, and if you do this practice, you'll start remembering lifetimes ago. And it's no different than remembering 10 years ago. The idea though is, is that if you're attached to this body and this self in that way, you're gonna be attached to that 10 years ago self and the one before that and the one before that. And this process works that way too, which is that insofar as I'm attached to this body and self, uh, it's like, I will, it gets tricky because the future hasn't arrived yet. But the idea is, is that I will identify with that body and this body and call it all Michael. So Brendan, I hope you see what I'm getting at as far as like how there can be reincarnation and not reincarnation. And what I want to point out is, is that if you believe Brendan, if you believe you, you were alive 10 years ago, then there's no reason from a Buddhist point of view, you shouldn't understand past lives because it's the same attachment. It's the same illusion. I, I thank you. I, actually, I've never heard you I, or anything that you've said. I've never understood it in that way. So either you've said it and I didn't get it or or you, this is new uh, to me, but uh, well, and, uh, yeah, what I'm hearing too is like, hey, it's been a while that you've been all, being all selfing, hardcore. It, you didn't just get to it at age four. It's, it's, it's kind of a habit you have. And, you know, I'm we're not, I'm, and talking you out of it or lo logically leading you to it isn't, is certainly a way, but it is not as simple as just like, yeah, I guess he's right. So now I'm liberated and I'm, I'm hearing that. And, and also, yeah, I think, um, uh, the, uh, you know, if I think about 10 years ago, I just think, well, it was all hell. It, it's, it was the same and different, you know, it was like, I was having the same moment to moment, like this is some shit that is happening now and it's all wacky and I don't like it. And today is, less I don't like it and you know a little bit more further down understanding it or whatever no self or however so yeah I, I'm uh yeah that's a that's a great response and I was and I yeah my first comment was uh I wasn't suggesting that that was your spin of like you know you chose it and I didn't hear that in any way at all I just I'm not sure why my mind went there but but yeah uh thank you yeah, yeah. No, you, you picked up on something I said. I just didn't want to make it sound like that's what the sutras, the message of the sutra was just suck it up or something like that. Yeah, yeah. No, and I was, and I should have, yeah, I realized that I should have said something. And, and yeah, and I guess I'm, I'm taking from what you're saying that like there is a Sanskrit original and there, and there are two translations that are not in that language. Is that what I'm hearing? 
uh, as far as this this sutra that we're reading. There's luckily we have these two versions, but they're not always agreeing. I got you, and they're based on some other. Sure. Oh, on for, unknown, on, on, uh, unknown Q. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, answers, ideas about Buddha lands and what's been going on? Cool. Well, would you like to hear one more? It's a short one. Western direction. A few minutes doesn't take long. Just to finish it out, it's a it's a, a pretty straightforward one too. So I don't think it will require much much commentary. But <clears throat> all right. Also, at that very moment, in a Buddha realm called Manigarbha, Jewel Treasury, located to the west, past trillions of Buddha realms, numbering 92 times the number of grains of sand in the Ganges River, there was a Tathagata named King Jewel Mound, who is still present, alive and well, and teaching the Dharma. The Buddha realm of that Tathagata was composed entirely out of fine barrel stone. The classifications of Shravaka and Pratekya Buddha didn't even exist there, for that Buddha realm was populated exclusively by bodhisattvas. Furthermore, whether these bodhisattvas came or went, stood or sat down, stayed still or moved about, they beheld the blessed Tathagata King Jewel Mound reflected in the ground of beryl, like a face reflected on the surface of a highly polished mirror. The bodhisattvas saw the Tathagata reflected in the ground of beryl. Not only did they see him, but they could also ask him about the Dharma, and that Tathagata would teach them. Hearing the Dharma, they gained kshanti, the patient acceptance. Because of this Tathagata's previous aspirations, a large precious gem was present in the middle of the coil of hair between his eyebrows. The light of this gem illuminated the entire Buddha land such that, except for the opening and closing of flowers, there was no other way to distinguish between day and night. As the sun and the moon were not evident, nor were there any other distinctions made between night and day. In the Tathagata King Jewel Mounds Buddha land, there was a Bodhisattva Mahasattva named Intelligent Aspiration. The Bodhisattva Great Being Intelligent Aspiration also witnessed the great burst of illumination and heard the clear voice. And so he went before the Blessed Tathagata, King Jewel Mound. Arriving there, he bowed his head at the feet of that world-honored one and sat to one side. The Bodhisattva Mahasattva Intelligent Aspiration then asked the Blessed Tathagata King Jewel Mound, World Honored One, what are the causes and conditions of this great illumination that has manifested in our world and this booming sound of a clear voice? That, that World Honored One answered, Noble One, in a Buddha realm called Saha, located to the east of here, past trillions of Buddha realms numbering 92 times the number of grains of sand in the Ganges River, there is a Tathagata, Arahat, Samyak Sambutta, named Shakyamuni, who is still present, alive and well, and teaching the Dharma. That Tathagata is gathering bodhisattvas from immeasurable countless trillions of worlds throughout 
the Ten Directions. In order to proclaim the Dharma, all the pores of his body emit this light and the sound of his clear voice. The Bodhisattva intelligent aspiration then proclaimed to King Jewel Mound Buddha, world honored one, I am going to the Saha world to behold, venerate, and honor the Tathagata Arhat Samyaksam Buddha Shakyamuni, as well as to see his gathering of bodhisattvas and hear his teaching of the Dharma. That world honored one replied, Noble one, if you know the moment is ripe, then go. With a single thought, the Bodhisattva intelligent aspiration surrounded and preceded by 42 trillion Bodhisattvas disappeared from that Buddha realm and arrived in the Saha world. The Bodhisattva intelligent aspiration then wondered, what kind of miracle shall I perform to go before the Tathagata Arahat Samyaksam Buddha Shakyamuni? So the Bodhisattva intelligent aspiration then caused all hell beings and all animals and all the beings in the realm of the Lord of Death within this great 3,000, great thousand world system to all experience the greatest of happiness. For the hell beings, he extinguished the fires of hell. He eliminated the hunger and thirst of all the preta, hungry ghosts, animals and beings in the realm of the Lord of Death who were tormented by hunger and thirst. He brought them the great happiness, analogous to the bliss experienced by a monk who is immersed in the attainment of the third dionic state. At the very moment this happiness arose in these beings, all the torments caused by greed, anger, delusion, rage, pride, hypocrisy, spite, jealousy, stinginess, deceit, aggression, and malice all ceased. At that moment, an attitude of love and compassion arose in all these beings, and they perceived one another as parents. Such were the miracles that that Bodhisattva performed, and such was the samadhi in which he was immersed. Once the Bodhisattva intelligent aspiration had displayed such miracles, he accompanied the other Bodhisattva Mahasattvas approaching the Tathagata Arahat Samyaksam Buddha Shakyamuni. Arriving there, they bowed their heads at the feet of the world honored one, circumambulated him three times, and sat to one side on seats of lotus flowers that had appeared in accordance with their aspirations. All right, so not much to say about that one, of course, <laughs> right? Um, beautiful, and that's time. So that's going to do it for me. Awesome. Thanks so much, Michael. That was great. <laughs> Yay. Thank you all for being here.